You're listening to the Valley Labor Report with David Story and Jacob Morrison. So Mary Beth Sides Brown is the interim organizing director for the New York News Guild uh, CWA Local 31003. And uh, folks, if you know anything about the News Guild, you know that they're busy. So, you know, Mary Beth's sister, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, for people, there are going to be folks that don't know what's somehow there are going to be folks who don't know about what's happening with the news guild the explosive organizing growth that you have seen over the past several years so help us give us like a thirty thousand kind of square uh uh, 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 foot view of what's happening with the the news guild um and 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 your recent organizing wave like how how many shops have y'all organized how many more uh, workers do you have as part of your membership and, and and stuff like that yeah so um i mean to put it simply journalists are organizing a lot uh there's been a huge wave of media workers organizing especially in the last five or so years so um, in the News Guild, we've had a growth from you know, 2016, 2017. Our whole international union has added about 45,000 members. Um, and our local, um, which is where I work, uh, went from about 3,000 members to 4,000 this year. And we're gonna be adding another 2,000 members by the end of 2021. So um, we've wow. seen really huge growth, um, have had over 100 successful campaigns in the last few years of organizing. Um, and I think it's only going to continue. So it's a really exciting time to be part of this industry, part of the labor movement. Um, and yeah, we're busy. <laughs> what was the number for, did you say 45,000 or 4,500 new members? 4,500, yeah. 4,500 <laughs> new members. That is amazing. That's that's just really fantastic. And how, how many shops is that? How many union elections have you won over the past few years? So, um, in our international, we've had over 100 campaigns. Not all of those have had to go to the National Labor Relations Board. A lot of them have gotten uh, what's called voluntary recognition, where you can bypass that process if the employer agrees, um, usually because you have a super majority of support. So, um, yeah, but have had many elections also, um, especially around the country and our international. Uh, and. For people, there's going to be a lot of folks that say, bypass the election. What does that mean? Why is that good? Is that bad? That sounds kind of scary. Talk to us about why the voluntary recognition is so important and it's something that unions fight for. And it's something that y'all have been able to win in in so many Mm -hmm. of these campaigns. Yeah. So if anyone has any experience with the National Labor Relations Board, they can tell you that uh, employers have rigged a lot of the process to drag it out to be able to make the process really procedural and bureaucratic and confusing. Um, And that really just benefits employers. It gives them months and months to be able to wage anti-union campaigns, to wear people down. Even people who really support the union just become really... Uh, demoralized and stressed out by constant anti-union campaigning. So, um, you know, the board rules have changed over time. Basically, with every administration, we get a slightly different set of rules as we get more or less favorable people on the board. Um, But even when it's a favorable board, uh, the process can be pretty lengthy and disempowering for some people. So Mm -hmm. um, a lot of unions um, build up pressure to... uh, demand voluntary recognition from their employers to basically say, if you want to live by the values, you know, it's common with progressive or mission driven, um, you know, nonprofit employers, et cetera, but not exclusively. But um, if you really want to not be anti-union, then voluntary recognition is is the best path to do that because um, it saves everyone a long, um, a long process that really just proves what we already knew from the beginning, which is members sign union cards as part of the organizing process. They cast their votes, they show their public support for the union. Um, And so often going through the NLRB process is just to reaffirm that. So, um, but you know, there are cases where the employer says no. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, And so you have to, um, 
you know, either escalate on that demand or go through the board process. So we've done both, but um, we have had a good amount of success in, um, you know, making voluntary recognition more of the norm within our industry. Right. And one of those that have not uh, opted to go with the industry standard of voluntary recognition, where a super majority of, of employees express public support for the union is MSNBC. Which, mm-hmm. if you <laughs> if you listen to this station, this conservative talk radio station, you would think uh, MSNBC is staffed with socialist re- is managed by is owned by socialist revolutionaries. So, <laughs> so if that's the uh, you know if that's the the tact that you take uh, or, or or the opinion you have of MSNBC, then that would be very surprising to you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that campaign is with the Writers Guild of America East, and they're doing awesome work on it. And I think it just shows that the, uh, you know, you can be a quote unquote progressive employer and still union bust. In fact, right. almost all of them do. So uh, and workers need to be prepared for union busting no matter who their employer is. Right. Um, and it can be very revealing to go through this process and see. You know, a boss is a boss is a boss. That's right. That's right. A <laughs> yeah, boss. Is, I, I'm yeah. so glad you're you're on today to reiterate that message because it's been kind of a theme of our show lately, mm-hmm. talking about MSNBC, uh, the National Education Association, and these other organizations, which at least you know pretend to be progressive, and are in some cases maybe they kind of are, but uh, when it comes to their own employees, it's often a different type of mentality. So. Right. A boss is a boss is a boss. We appreciate you <laughs> saying that. We're going to live by that motto. Right. So um, we are, we're, we've only got like about a minute left in this segment, so so we're going to have to pick it up on the other side of the break. But before we go, why don't you start us off hel- helping us to contextualize this recent explosive organizing wave. Like why now and why in the news industry? Yeah, well, the news industry is under attack. Um, You know, employers are consolidating their power. So the largest newspaper chain, Gannett, recently had a merger with Gatehouse, which is one of the other major chains. They now own one out of every five newspapers across the country. Um, A hedge fund called Alden Global Capital recently bought up Tribune Publishing. So if you like the New York Daily News, Chicago Tribune, now they are owned by a hedge fund and they're the second largest newspaper chain in the U.S. Um, And really since 2008, newsroom employment has plummeted. So we've lost half of newsroom jobs. The overall news industry employment's down 23%. And it's because owners are consolidating their power and um, they are extracting more and more profit from the industry, trying to reduce labor as much as possible. Um, And I think just like workers everywhere else, there's been constant layoffs, wages are stagnant, healthcare costs are skyrocketing. Um, and people don't feel like they have a voice on the job to be able to fight back. So they're doing what workers for all history have done, which is joining together collectively. Um, but I think that there's just been particularly visible um, and dramatic attacks on the industry by hedge funds, by these um, monopolies, essentially, these monopoly corporations. And um, people have realized the only way to move forward is together. Right. That's exactly. And and so we're coming up on a break now. We're going to pick this up on the other side of the break. And I, I want to know some of, you know, you're mentioning the power structures there and why the conditions are so bad in the news industry. Uh, I, I want to learn more about, like, what are specifically journalists, anchors and, and, and things like this uh, facing. So we're going to talk more to Mary Beth on the other side. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Valley Labor Report with David Story and Jacob Morrison. this morning she's hanging out with us uh having some fun i appreciate it uh the donuts i have not had time to eat one yet but i'm sure they're very good uh so (laughs) um we're talking to mary beth sides brown she is the interim 
director of organizing for the New York News Guild, CWA, Local 31003, uh, about their explosive uh, new organizing that they have uh, that, that they've seen over the past few years. And she was giving us some context of the you know the the, the news industry has gotten really really tough to be a worker inside of. And, and she explained some of the reasons for that, some of the structural reasons, the consolidation of power by the bosses, um, by corporations, by you know the, the, these huge institutions uh, buying out smaller places uh, and, and, and thus giving workers less power. So wh- what are actually the conditions on the ground and in the newsroom that are resulting from that? Yeah, so as all of that consolidation happens and bosses want to extract more and more profit from fewer and fewer people, um, your job gets a lot harder, unsurprisingly. So, um, you know, everything from we've seen members who organize to um, get rid of onerous story quotas. So, you know, they're expected almost like they're turning out widgets (laughs) uh, to turn out a certain number of stories um, in a really... Uh, a stressful amount of time. So for example, Law 360, which is a legal newswire that organized in 2016, one of the the first few shops that kicked off the organizing wave in our local, um, they had a requirement that they needed to turn out a story every two hours, um, which if you've ever (laughs) reported a story, you know, especially if you're talking about legal complicated concepts, to do all of that work, write an entire piece and publish it, and then move on and do that four times per day is really stressful. Um, You know, a lot of members before they organize don't have access to overtime, but they're expected to work around the clock. If you're in the news business, you're kind of always on. There's always stuff on your beat that you need to be prepared for. Um, and you had fewer and fewer resources to do it. So, you know, we've recently organized a couple newsrooms in uh, New Jersey, for example, um, and just New Jersey media has absolutely uh, consolidated and where people used to be able to report on one town or one beat, they're now expected to report on larger and larger parts of the state, longer and longer hours, and their pay is stagnant. Um, For some people, it's effectively lower than it's been for their entire careers because they haven't gotten a raise in 20 years. So um, it's really stressful work. And yeah. I think during, especially the Trump administration, as you know, he attacks journalists, a lot of those folks felt more and more like their work is a public good. If you are reporting during the pandemic, that's life-saving information to report on how to stay safe, what's happening in your community, what's happening with your local government, Um, You know, there's this tension that arises from I need to deliver this information to my community and I have no resources to do it um, because my boss wants to save as much money as possible and sell off this newsroom for parts, essentially. So all of that, um, you know, on top of, you know, the news media business, just like every other business, is very racist, very sexist. There's been the Me Too movement. There's been all the conversations in the last year after the George Floyd protests. Um, all of this leaving, you know, newsrooms, which are overwhelmingly white um, and often led by white men, feeling uh, like they can't actually do their jobs well without being seen and respected and paid appropriately Um, and invested in to be able to grow. So I think those are all of the sort of day-to-day conditions that have led people to say, you know, it's not, we can't just do this with a diversity committee. We can't just do this on our own. We need to form a union, have bargaining power and take collective action um, because it's it's just too much. Right, right. And that's, you you know, I, uh, I, I, I spoke about this last week about how, you know, and and that's something that you mentioned before the break, or or, or that you kind of alluded to about the, the the corporations really trying to squeeze everything they can out of the workers and the institutions that they own that that they that they they manage not through virtue of their labor or their uh you know. 
ability to report the truth accurately or to facilitate such accurate reporting, uh, they own it by virtue of their wealth. And really a better way to think about these institutions as institutions is really like hedge funds that have a that ha- that that also invest in a newsroom you know which mm-hmm. is not to say that that that, that reporters or anchors um like that's not to say that they're doing bad work or that they are that they they um are have malignant intentions or or uh, malicious intentions i mean or anything like that but the people that own these institutions do and you know and, and so the reporters and, and everybody is having to operate within that system and so how do we how do we give the workers who want to report the truth who want to be independent who want to uh be able to uh, uh uh challenge and speak truth to power how do we give them the ability to do that it's to give them more power and autonomy and the best way to do that is through unionization Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that the, um, you know, hedge funds in particular, they really, there's nothing, there are hedge funds in every industry, right? It's not like the news business is unique. It's just that I think this is actually a, a clarifying moment for some journalists to realize, oh yeah, we're like every other worker. Right. <laughs> hedge funds are going to come to us just like they've come to hospitals and retail. Um, and we have more in common with the Toys R Us workers who were a victim of private equity uh, than, than we think. Um, so I think it's been really clarifying for a lot of people to see the way that the, the industry is not immune to all of the same patterns that have been happening throughout the economy. Um, and that's also, I think, a radicalizing experience to then realize I am a worker. I'm not just a professional. I'm not just... You know, I think sometimes white collar uh, intellectual workers don't necessarily feel connection to the working class, right. um, but realizing that you have the you know common experiences of being shaped by the same trends that are happening across the economy can can make you realize I'm a worker too, and I need the same right. protections other workers have. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's you know I have coworkers. Uh, I. Obviously, I'm in a union, and mm-hmm. I I have a more you, you know maybe an intellectual job. I like I work in an office, right? And and um, you know my labor comes from my brain as opposed to like my muscles, and uh, which is convenient for me. Uh, but, <laughs> but you know, uh, like I have coworkers who are not members of the union, and they're like, I don't understand why we need a union. Like uh, you know we we have you know uh, I'm fine. I I don't I'm not like a coal miner or whatever. And it's like that doesn't it doesn't matter whether you like you know pick up rocks or you fill out spreadsheets you are selling your labor and you have a boss like that's all it takes to need a union and we meet those criteria so we we need a union and so does every worker who meets those criteria if you sell your labor whether you're you know picking up rocks or filling in spreadsheets or anything else and you have a boss then you need a union, and and that yeah, uh, that's such an important point that you that 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 you you brought out there uh, because so many professional workers, quote unquote, you know, professional workers, people who have degrees, they don't like to conceive of themselves that way, and I think that's that's kind of by design. There's a lot of institutions. There's you know that's really convenient for our bosses. That's very convenient for our bosses. That that a lot of people in these blue uh, these white collar professional quote unquote jobs don't like to conceive of themselves as workers. It's very convenient for our bosses. We're talking to Mary Beth Seitz Brown, the interim organizing director of the New York News Guild, and she's going to tell us some of their best, uh, uh, highlight some of the contract wins and some of the worker stories from their recent organizing growth. On the other side of this break, stay tuned. Jacob Morrison here with my co-host Adam Keller. We are talking to Mary Beth Seitz Brown. She is the interim organizing director for the News Guild of New York, CWA, local 31003. Um, and you know, 
we we mentioned at the top of the segment they have had 4500 new workers like a hundred shops organized over the past several uh, over the past few years no other union in the country is really seeing this kind of uh no other industry, I should say, the W, the Writers Guild of America East is, is also seeing some some pretty big organizing. But the but no other industry in the United States is seeing this kind of this kind of explosive growth. And and so, really excited to be able to talk to her about that uh, today on the show. So, can you tell us, Mary Beth, what some of the uh, you know, we, what are some of the things that workers have been able to win through their organizing with the News Guild? Yeah, so um, we're coming off of just a few, I think two weeks ago, um, uh, three shops at Condé Nast. So the New Yorker, Ars Technica, and Pitchfork all won um, after a credible strike threat where they were about to walk off the job. Um, they won a really amazing set of um, agreements in their contract. So that's everything from uh, lifting the pay floor to something that's at least mostly livable in New York City, uh, $60,000 a year, which is a big improvement from what people were paid before. Um, overtime and comp time. Um, they've also um, done some really interesting things around non-disclosure agreements. So if people remember from the Me Too era, um, one of the main ways that uh, Harvey Weinstein, for example, was able to keep uh, his victims quiet was for by having them all sign non-disclosure agreements where they took a sum of money in order and to agree to basically not say anything about the treatment they experienced. So that's not just happening uh, in Hollywood. It also has happened in, in the media industry. And so um, these workers put, a, you know, got a win on banning NDAs for um, sexual harassment and racial discrimination. Um, They've also got some really interesting language around diversity and um, issues of diversity inclusion at the workplace. So uh, they won a company-wide commitment that at least half of the candidates who are being considered for jobs have to come from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, And like I was saying earlier, News is, uh, and the media industry is very white, um, largely, you know, historically has privileged people who come from upper class backgrounds who can take really low wages because they have family money. Um, and that's kept the media having, you know, when people say the liberal elite media, <laughs> there's right. an element of truth to, you know, who's been able to afford to take those jobs. Right. Um, so I think that is going to be one of the most important things in this wave of organizing is creating industry standards that make sure that people can afford to live in the city that they work in and that there are actual contractually enforceable agreements around um, you can't just talk the talk and put up your Black Lives Matter statement Mm -hmm. um, after protests. You need to actually do the work to recruit people to come and shape your newsroom and shape your coverage. So I'm really incredibly proud of all of the work that they did to secure all those wins because I think that's going to pave the way for all of these other workers who've organized who are still fighting for their first contracts to get similar agreements um, and make that, you know, the new industry norm. And that's part of why we do new organizing, right? Going back to, all right, all this explosive growth, what's the purpose? Sometimes, you know, we have debates within the labor movement about, you know, new organizing versus, um, you know, working with your existing membership. But through new organizing, you can have more industry density and right. fight for these kinds of provisions and make them a norm by having your members coordinate and push the same contract language. So. Um, you know, that's not just at the New Yorker, but also we had PC Magazine and Mashable and Quartz, three other outlets also recently got their first contracts um, and had that similar language as well. So it's incredible to see, um, in addition to the sort of economic stuff that people always fight for, what are some of the non-economic things that people want to do to change the industry, the way it looks and operates and who gets to be in it? I think that is so important, and that's something else we've discussed quite a bit on the show, is that when we when we want to fight discrimination, sexual harassment, and other forms of of bigotry in the workplace, that is best fought from the bottom up through bargaining power and union organizing, not by you know just hoping and praying that your bosses will have a uh, effective HR department. 
that's mm-hmm. not the way to to make lasting change there so i think sometimes there's a uh, these artificial conflicts between labor you know it, fighting labor issues and fighting issues of race and gender discrimination but really the two go hand in hand and if you mm-hmm. are a worker who's being discriminated against on the job the best uh outlet you have should be a union right and that's and, and hr departments are they they work for your boss i mean you know i yeah i'm mm-hmm. um, not to say that maybe there aren't some good-natured hr people but like their their paycheck is written by your boss right and a union is th- so there's a fundamental conflict of interest there uh but a union if you've got staff for the union who's that paid for it's paid for by you they work for you literally and then the ones that aren't staff the, you're just member organizers you are doing it on your own time or your brothers and sisters on the job are doing it on their own time there's you know there's not that conflict of interest there um th- there's there's much more kind of real worker power through unions than through hr departments um and and you mentioned that about the how important it is to set industry standards so that people that don't have privileged backgrounds can come into these industries you know uh conservatives say that uh that minimum wages stop people from being able to get on the first rung of the ladder and that's just it's it's absurd on its face because there are still places in this country where you can have un paid internships like dc like these big law firms and so this is like this should be the test case okay you you, you've got people working for free there's no minimum wage and who is it is it un is it underrepresented people that are getting on this first rung of the ladder and climbing their way up the ladder no it's people who have privilege whose parents can uh, uh can fund their summer internship completely in dc uh and and those people get into Congress. Those people get into the law firms. Those people get into the newsrooms because they're privileged, not because having no minimum wage helps people climb up the ladder. It's, it's silly. So setting these industry standards for people as they come into the industry, so important for people to actually be able to actually climb the ladder. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, the media plays such a huge role in, I think we all, a lot of people often say, you know, the media this, the media that. And it's true that it's one of the most powerful industries in terms of shaping public perception of almost everything around us, right? Like, this is how we learned about, um, you know, it's how we learn about police violence. It's how we learn about what's happening in the economy. It's how we learn about what's happening in our government. Right. And it really matters that there are people reporting those stories who understand them from firsthand experience and who have uh, a view that is not just the, you know, the normative view on things. And if we are able to change the makeup of newsrooms so that they genuinely reflect all of the people um, that they're reporting on in those communities, Um, That, I think, is going to have a lasting impact for generations, but it's going to require contractual commitments that are legally enforceable. So I think you're right that that's something that, you know, I've seen a lot. Companies have very effectively captured the narrative on diversity, equity, and inclusion as something that is separate from union issues. That those are, you know, uh, DEI, you know, diversity, et cetera. That's something that a consultant does. It's not something that workers do. Um, and I think that is so wrong and is so important to challenge because, as you said, um, if management and bosses are leading that work, they're always going to make sure that they don't have to be held accountable. Right. If workers are leading that work, um, they can hold their bosses accountable with different tools like a union contract, like collective action. Um, and that has a much different accountability than, you know, we've hired yet another DEI consultant to come in and tell us, you know, that we're too white. So um, I'm really excited to see what this, all of these wins are going to translate to in five, 10 years um, as slowly we're starting to create these sort of structural shifts through, through members organizing. Right. That, yeah. I mean, that's just nail on the head, nail on the head. So Mary Beth, we've got about two minutes left and uh, we'll go ahead and let you go. So can, what, do you have any closing thoughts? Like what, you know, what, what are kind of, what, do you have any closing thoughts for, for the audience about the explosive organizing that we've seen in the news industry or what you what you want folks to understand? Or if there's anybody at some of the local news stations or some of the local papers here that, that, that may be listening, what would you say to people? <laughs> well, I would say that, you know, we 
at the News Guild don't have to be unique. There's nothing super special about what we are doing. Um, we're just doing a strong organizing program. <laughs> we're organizing workers. We are agitating around the issues that matter to them. We are building super majority campaigns. And that's really hard work. It's so not to say that it is easy, but it is pretty straightforward. <laughs> um, right. You know, the program is possible for other unions to take up. Um, and, you know, this, there's no secret thing about journalists that are somehow uh, more organizable than other workers. Um, if anything, I think our members just have a big platform and spotlight. So, you know, all of us probably see when... New York Times tech workers organize or the New Yorker wins a, a contract more than we might see hotel workers winning their contract or nursing home workers that want a new union. Um, and so I think our members, you know, are really in the spotlight because they are in the media. Um, but I hope that spotlight shows other unions that it's possible, not that we are the exception. Right. Um, and I think that there is, you know, winning is addictive. Once you get a couple wins, <laughs> that's part of the wave is people see, right. okay, if they can do it, we can do it. Um, and I hope that other workers, your listeners, people in other industries, um, that the, the takeaway is not so much the News Guild is so special and different, but rather if they can do it, we can do it too. And we should, we should try. We should get an organizing program off the ground. We should organize our workplace um, because it is possible. Wow, that's that's great. I I can't think of any. Yeah, that that's so cool. The News Guild isn't. It doesn't have to be special because you're just doing what unionists have done uh, throughout the history of the labor movement here in this country and uh, and and winning for workers. Uh, Mary Beth, thank you so much. The American Federation of Government Employees, AFGE Local 1858, believes all workers are entitled to fairness, dignity, and respect. AFGE also knows that the best way to guarantee proper treatment is for workers to stand together, united, looking out for each other. In AFGE, we fight for workers every day to ensure a workplace that is safe and free from harassment. If you're a federal employee and want to be a part of this union to protect yourself and your fellow workers, call 256-876-4880. If you want to see what we're up to throughout the week and get our snide quips about the news of the day, then you should follow us on social media. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Valley Labor Report. We are on Twitter at Labor Reporters. I'm on Twitter at Jacob M underscore A L. And if you missed part of the show and want to go back and watch it later, you can search YouTube for the Valley Labor Report and subscribe to our channel. You can go back and watch the full show there. And we also clip segments and release them throughout the week. Uh, we also upload the program on more than 11 different podcasting apps. So to see if we are on your listening platform of choice, you can go to the Valley Labor Report .transistor.fm slash subscribe. We've got a website where you can buy our hats and stickers. We've only got 20 hats left, so you're going to want to grab one of those before we're out. That's the Valley Labor Report .org. And finally... If you appreciate our work and want to help us stay on the air, consider throwing us a couple dollars a month on patreon.com slash the Valley Labor Report. 